My name is Mark Middleton. I'm the uh, managing Hi. partner for Grimshaw London. So welcome everybody here this morning. Thank you for all getting up so early. I'm on the panel, so I'm not going to show my hand just yet. But um, all I want to say is get your opinions ready. I hope you enjoy this debate. And I'd like to hand over to the organiser of this event, Nathan Garnett, for, who's uh, events director for UK Construction Week, to welcome you and to give you the, uh, give you the lowdown. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you for allowing us to use your, uh, your great space here for our event this morning. Um, I just thought I'd take the opportunity just to give you a little bit of information about who we are, UK Construction Week. This event has been organised in a collaboration with World Architecture News. So this is our mission statement. So we are an event in the UK in October. Basically, our aim is to bring together the built environment. Um, we're doing this through a number of events. So we have eight events all taking place at the NEC. Um, in October. Every one of them is designed for a different sector of the UK construction industry. So our plan is to bring all of those people together. So UK Construction Week comes together, 30,000 people over one week, 1,000 exhibitors, products and suppliers, and our partners represent 2 million people in this construction industry. So it really is um, bringing everyone together and we're looking to shape the agenda of the UK construction industry. And we've had a number of events to do that already. This is one of them as well. And we'll be continuing all the way up till October and beyond to, to, to do that. So just to give you a brief introduction to this survey that we've taken um, with uh, World Architecture News, we took, it took place between the 21st and the 29th of April online. Hopefully some of you took part in that. 3,200 people, which uh, obviously we're very pleased with that result. It's a good sample. Um, and there were some key findings, which I'm going to uh, just briefly introduce. And obviously, the, the idea of this today's panel and Q&A is that we digest and discuss those at length. So our top line results are not probably a massive surprise to you. They kind of mirror a lot of the polls um, that you've read and seen in the press. Although polls, obviously, we know from last year, um, from the election, can be wrong. The top line. Uh, results are a bit contradictory we have to say so for example on, on infrastructure overwhelmingly negative feeling about brexit it would have a negative impact on our on our infrastructure in terms of trading with the eu probably not surprising again um, that people felt that that would have a negative impact if we left the eu 50 percent of construction individuals felt that leaving would also have um, a detrimental effect on our skill shortage now, we know that's a massive point for discussion today, um, and I'm sure we'll be able to elaborate a bit more on that. But here is where the contradictions come in, because the survey also said that leaving would give us opportunities. Over half of the people surveyed said, actually, there'd be opportunities of leaving. Um, so there's, that's obviously a massive point for discussion. 70% of contractors said that actually leaving would give the UK manufacturing industry more support from the government, perhaps. Again, another point for discussion. So not all remain or leave. And obviously the housing crisis as well, interestingly, you'll all see on your survey results that uh, actually leaving, people felt that that would improve um, the housing situation in the UK. So lots to talk about. Um, I'm, I'd like to say thank you to World Architecture News for putting this together, T Tessa and Michael. Um, and Brian, thank you for hosting today's event. and. Uh, moderating what I'm sure is going to be a really lively event. So um, I'd like to hand over to you. Great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Nathan, Mark, thanks for your introduction, and thanks very much to Grimshaw for hosting us here in this, uh, in this great little event space. Thank you very much. So I'm Brian Kilkelly. Uh, I am the development lead for Climate Kick. So I'll announce, you know, right, I'm working for an EU institution. Um, so you can, you can tell which side I'm on maybe already, although I'm neutral of course, I'm the moderator, so I'll try my best not to, uh, not to skew the, the debate. Uh, I'm also the founder of World Cities Network, which is a partner organisation of World Architecture News, uh, so it's great to be here this morning. So my role is to uh, uh, you know, get the best out of the debate, uh, and uh, I want to uh, make sure that we get as much opportunity for interaction with your good selves as well, because uh, this, is, uh, this is an incredibly uh, important issue. Uh, I mean, I know there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about it. I mean, I talk about it with my friends and, and professions. I travel a lot around Europe. I know our, our colleagues in Europe are very concerned. 
about uh, what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's rare, isn't it, that we sit together in a room uh, uh, and we actually have presented in front of us something that's important to us all here in the UK and in the rest of the world as a decision like this. So uh, I'm delighted you know, to be here and to be involved actively in this debate, to be helping to form opinions. And hopefully, you know, we all go away from this uh, better informed and better able to make a decision, uh, whichever way that might be. Um, so I know the debate is, uh, often swings uh, around issues that we think sometimes are less informed than they could be. So this is our opportunity to get well informed. So uh, you know, let's take the opportunity to, to grill our panelists to get their opinions and to try and understand what's, uh, what's happening. And uh, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists. So on, uh, my, on, my, on your right, is Brian, Brian Berry, uh, and Brian is the Chief Executive of the Federation of Master Builders, ex-teacher, expert on policy at an EU level, also used to work for the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, Brian, I believe, yeah? So Brian, welcome. Next we have uh, Cesare Bednarski. Cesare, welcome. Cesare is the architect, uh, principal at Studio Bednarski, uh, a man of the world, if I may say. So well-traveled. Uh, has worked uh, with EU, with UNESCO, uh, and uh, in many different countries around the world. Next we have Paul Scully, Conservative MP for Cheam and Sutton. Paul, welcome. Paul is, uh, in his biography, very much talks about the importance of local issues. So we're gonna be swinging from the global to the local. Uh, so we're, we're relying on Paul to help us put this in perspective of, uh, of, the, of the world, the local world. So thanks for joining, Paul. <coughs> Next we have David Cash. David is chairman of BDP uh, and also uh, recently took up a position on the Construction Leadership Council, forming the Construction Leadership Council, uh, and has got a lot of expertise on the ex export issues. So uh, it'll be a very important part of the debate this morning. Mark is our very generous host, Mark Middleton, uh, managing partner here of the London office of Grimshaws. Uh, Mark, again, has got an incredible amount of global experience working in far from places like Korea and Russia. And uh, he's a bit of a man of steel. <laughs> really? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe beneath there, there's a, like a super steel thing. Apparently, you like designing in steel or using steel in design. <laughs> yes, yes. I try not to talk about it too often. <laughs> <laughs> that was between you and I, Brian. <laughs> All right. Good. So, um, so welcome, panelists. So what we'll kick off with is I'm just going to ask the panelists to give me their views just a kind of quick two or three minute view on what they think about the issue, just as an opening, and then we'll go into a bit of a discussion with the, with the panelists. So Brian, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what, uh, what's your view on this issue? Which camp are you in? Uh, well, I'm on the, uh, on the inn, um, but our members as a trade association, we, we haven't taken a view, and uh, we know what happened to the Chief Executive of the British Chambers of Commerce. So, um, <laughs> but I have permission to sort of uh, give my own personal view about remaining inside the European Union. Um, just so I'm here really in terms of the FNB, um, our members are small local builders that you find all across the country, typical uh, family businesses um, who do talk about the uh, problems of red tape uh, facing their business. Um, but on the flip side, uh, they rely on, on uh, skilled labour and there is a uh, growing skills crisis in this country at the moment. So therefore, the positive benefit of the European Union is in terms of labour mobility. Um, we did do a survey of our members, and 80% of our members are saying that actually they're basing their decision on personal beliefs, not on just uh, their business interests. So I think that's quite an interesting finding. So it's, the look, people are looking at it much, in a much wider context and just thinking what is good for our business. Um, interestingly, over half say actually they need more information. They don't feel they're getting enough information uh, and understand the issues. Um, and certainly when I go around the country talking to our members, uh, there are mixed views, very strong views on both sides. But the majority, I'd say, are in listening mode still, trying to work out what is best for them as a small business in this country. Um, so that just gives you a broad overview of where we're coming from, from the FNB. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Cesare, what would your would you view be on this? Well, I first of all have to explain to you who I am. I'm a Polish immigrant, and I came here in '81. I was hunted by the immigration. I went grey at the age of 29, 
I worked for Grimshaw 8384 in my first practice. So I'm talking from a rather confused position, which is both of the immigrant, the Pole, and God knows what else. But I've spent 35 years in this country, which is most of my life. Now, what is happening now that both camps confuse everybody? I mean, Cameron coming up and saying that we have a World War III if we, you know, if we leave is complete bollocks, basically. And the same thing goes for the other camp. You know, so there is, you know, everybody is looking to their crystal balls and trying to guess the future. You know, my preference is to touch my balls and make a personal decision. Now, the only way to decide is on the philosophical level. And I've got two quotes for you. I've got like, lots of quotes. But let's start from J Jim Slater. You remember Jim Slater? Famous investor and genius. He said, elephants don't gallop. Okay? So if you want to be nimble and quick and so on, you don't stay in Europe. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones you did. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from the safe harbor, <laughs> catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. My view is that if we vote out of Europe, and I'm not against Europe, and I'm against immigration, those are no problems for me at all. You know? And the decision is not immigration, social, economic, or whatever. The decision is philosophical. Change brings new wind. Change brings new opportunities. Change forces us to do things we would not do otherwise. So I'm out. Great, that's very clear. Thanks, Azari. <laughs> Paul, what would your view be? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here. I actually, on my way here, I actually just saw a Dilbert cartoon uh, that someone tweeted this morning. It was talking about business, but it could easily be about the EU. It says, I added all the product features that each of you demanded. Now our product is a worthless hodgepodge of complexity. I appreciate your input. I couldn't have failed without you. And it's this, this sort of um, complexity that we've built up over uh, 40, 50 years in the EU that started really having concern for me. But there are three reasons that I want to leave. First of all, is trade. Um, I'm, as, uh, as uh, we've heard, I'm, I'm an optimist too. I don't want to be shackled to uh, effectively a, a stagnant customs union. There are two continents in the world that haven't grown up over the last 10 years, Antarctica and Europe. So I want to be able to trade further than that. I want to be able to go to India. I want to be able to go to China, to Bangladesh. Most of our clothes that we're wearing are probably the, the, the fabrics from uh, Bangladesh. M most, a lot of the, uh, the products that we buy come on container ships from China. Trading around the world is so much easier with big super containers and with the internet. And so that's why I would like to go further afield. Immigration for me is an issue, but I'm the son of an immigrant. My father was born in Burma, so I've seen the good side of, an issue, of, of immigration but we do need to control the numbers. But we need to control it in a fair way. And we can't do that with one arm uh, tied behind our back, shackled by the, uh, by the freedom of movement of people within the EU. So I believe that I would rather be able to pick skilled people from around the world, whether it's from America, Australia, Canada, India, Bangladesh, these sort of places, and have them have as, just as much, or if not in front of the queue, rather than unskilled migrants from, say, Spain or France or or other, uh, other, other members of the EU. And finally is sovereignty, decision making. I'm a, a, a politician, you can kick me out in 2020, you can kick out the government in 2020 if you don't like what we're doing. If you try to understand the complexities of the EU, you're, you're a better man than I. Claude, uh, John Claude Juncker said about the Greek debt, he said, when it gets serious, you have to start lying. That's a direct quote from the man that runs the European Commission. Which is, uh, which is remarkable. So I want to have sovereignty and have decision making come back here as best we can. We're a net contributor to the EU. We can argue about the figures, about how much we are contributing, but undoubtedly we're a net contributor. I want to bring as much of that money back here to be able to spend on the issues that we have in Britain for Britain. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. David. Right, well, I'm an architect, not a politician. Uh, I'll be voting to say, stay in the EU next month, and I'll be doing that for a number of reasons. First of all, economics, and you know, architects don't often talk about economics, but if we're in the construction industry, I think we have to recognise that our fortunes are really closely tied to the economic fortunes of this country. And having been through a few recessions, I know just how, how tough it can be for us. And it just seems to me that whether you look at the long term or the short term, to, to come out of the EU at this point in time just doesn't make any sense. But from a long term point of view, 
the number of major international com companies from all parts of the world, financial institutions, etc., that come to this country because not not you know, because, partly because of Britain and you know, our language, etc., but also because it gives them access into the European Union. Uh, it would be crazy to give that up. And in the short term, uh, you've only got to look and see what the uncertainty uh, has, has, has done over the last few months and project that over the next few years. I think in the short term, we'd been, we, we really would be in for a very tough patch if we come out of the EU at this time. I mean, so much of our trade is done with European countries, you know, they're our main trading partners at the current time. Secondly, um, I think there's, there's definitely a question of identity, and there's been so much talk about uh, you know, Europe telling us what to do and all the rest of it. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm quite happy to be English and live within the, within the United Kingdom. I'm happy to be British and part of Europe. And you know, when I'm in some parts of the world, I feel I'm more of a European than I'm a Brit. Uh, in other parts, I feel you know, being English is fine. Uh, to me, it seems that what we have at the moment is a great balance. Um, we're not in the Euro, and I think it's a great thing that we're not in the Euro, but we are in Europe, and that gives us a say in, in what's basically a major body within the world. You know, we've, we've punched above our weight over the years, but um, quite frankly, if, 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 if we're not in a significant body, then, then I think that uh, we, we, we're, we're going to struggle to, to make our mark. The third point I'd like to make uh, is, is relates to something that Cesare said just now. I mean, I, I don't think we should forget the fact that there were two major world wars that started in Europe in the last century. Uh, and yet for the last 70 years, it's not been perfect, but we've managed to find a way of working together. And I think we've had a very good period of time. And I want to see that continue. Uh, so I'm definitely going to be voting yes, and I'll stay in for next month. Thank you very much, David. Mark. I, um, I'm, I too am Remain for a, for a few sort of different reasons, although I agree with some of the panel members. The first is, um, it's a general one, I sort of want to be positive. I like being European, I like being part of the EU, I like being able to travel freely, I like being able to buy you know, cheap Italian wine and some, some nice mozzarella. I like all of the things that we enjoy and our lifestyles enjoy. Um, I like to be able to travel without visas and things like that and I think that, that has enriched a, a lot of people's lives in this country. Um, I also think that, you know, we, it, this is in the EU or not, I think actually the UK occupies a kind of a third position. We're not part of the Eurozone, we're not part of Schengen, we're not part of, you know, we've opted out of a lot of, um, a lot of these policies. And if you look at someone, uh, a country, if you actually ask yourself the question, who, who complies with 100% of all EU directives? That country is Norway. And the interesting thing about Norway <laughs> is that Norway isn't in the EU. It has to because it has to trade with us, so it has to comply, but it doesn't have a seat at the table. It can't affect the, um, the policies and it can't opt, opt out of them. It's just basically got to take it whether it likes it or not. And I think in the last thing, and this is a very personal thing for, for, for us as architects, we're an international practice. More than 60% of our income comes from around the world, not from the EU, from Australia, America, South America, um, Southeast Asia. And we do that under trade agreements that have been um, negotiated by the EU. And the UK hasn't actually negotiated a trade deal since 1974. I don't think we've actually got any trade negotiators left. So what we would have to do is, even though there'd be a two-year gap or something, a transition, we would have to try and renegotiate all of these deals with countries around the world. And we'd, you know, in theory, we could go from having one, one deal to having to have hundreds of deals to, to actually d deal with different countries. And that, that would affect my business. That's, that's a very, very personal view. So yes, I would vote Remain. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Mark. Great. Well, thank you all very much for being so uh, succinct. I, uh, I didn't even, almost didn't have any job to do. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, so let's, let's pick up on the, uh, on the housing issue to start with. I think that's quite, a, uh, quite an interesting one that comes out of the, uh, the survey. There's this kind of uh, debate, I think, about uh, the fact that the housing crisis that we're facing uh, will get better or worse, depending on your views of whether you remain in or out. Um, and uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with, uh, with, uh, with David. I'm going to pick on you on this one, David, to see if you've got a, got a view on the kind of housing. I mean, you, so this seems like a mixed view. Some people say that, uh, you know, that, that the housing crisis has partly been fueled by immigration and by the, the rise of population. Some say that, you know, we're only able to deal with the housing crisis because we're able to bring in skilled workers from outside of the UK. 
what's view, your view? Is this uh, you know, which which way will the housing crisis go, depending on whether we remain in or, or, well, or leave? I, the, well, the, the first comment I, I'd like to make. I mean, I don't want to diminish the housing crisis, and, and, I, and I think it's an important issue. But I'm not convinced that it's correct to link the housing crisis to the EU in or out debate because. Uh, it, the housing crisis is a comparatively recent issue, and you know the EU in out debate is, is a very long term issue. I, I, I think that we should be, you know, I certainly don't think that we should ever be doing this again. Hopefully, you know, I, I, I was around, I was a student last time there was a, there was a referendum on, on in or out, and it seems to me that it's the sort of decision that you make and then you stick with and you and you just go with it. But I mean, I. It, we, we need to solve the housing problem. Personally, I think the fact that there, there are people coming in from, from outside is, well, it's important because it, 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 it enriches the cultural richness of, of, of our country. And I think particularly London, actually. I mean, I don't live in London. I, I live in the north. Um, but I, I, th I think London is a fantastic city. And one of the reasons why it's so fantastic is its, is its cultural diversity. But there is obviously a big problem in that we need to get more social housing in particular, more affordable housing in, in the city centres. Or the city centre. How, how staying in or out of the EU will help that, I, I can't really put the two things together particularly. And on issue. How about you, Brian? You seem to be a... Yeah, well, there, there, there is a housing crisis in this country, but you can't just blame immigrants on the housing crisis. It's the fact that we're all living longer. Uh, the way we live, more people tend to live on their own. Uh, which is having an impact and the, the solution to the housing crisis is quite complex but actually we need to release more land, we've got to think of other creative ways of using existing buildings uh, to create more space. Um, now if we came out of the European Union uh, I, I think investment in housing particularly in central London would decline, I think there's evidence to support that from the RICS survey. Um, but I think the the bigger problem, particularly for my members who do repair and maintenance work, is the economic shock it will give the economy. If we come out of the European Union, there will be uh, a number of years where the economy shudders. I'm sure it will recover, but during that period, that's going to really knock the work in the construction industry because people will be less confident about upgrading their homes, um, which means that that will have a negative impact on my members' work. So. Uh, the housing issue is wider than the European Union. I think it's just uh, a, a, a peculiar sort of British attitude that we have in using homes as investment. And uh, I think the solutions are to be found here in the UK. And if we were to release more land for, for housing, if we were to tackle um, social housing, so government, uh, national government was to put more money into social housing, we could solve it quite quickly. And uh, so. I think it would be wrong to use immigrants as causing the, the housing crisis in this country. Great. Thank you. So Zara, you've talked a lot about uh, you know, new horizons, exploring new, new places, setting sail. Well, I, how, I, how will sort of uh, leaving, leaving help us to deal with the housing crisis? Well, first of all, let me start from the concept of affordable housing. You know, most of my clients buy affordable housing. The houses cost about 17 to 20 million pounds, so they're entirely affordable. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to start thinking about what kind of housing we are talking about. You know, this, this country, especially London, especially where I live, Kensington, you know, is a, is a laundry for the most of dirty money of the planet. You know, all these guys come and put money into this. The property goes up like crazy. I built my own house in Notting Hill, stroke of luck. You know, it went up four times in value in the last six years. I mean, this is completely surreal, but that's a different level. I think we are talking about housing for people. And the problem in this country is there's no provision at all and there's no mechanism to provide affordable housing at the low income level. So we're talking about land, we are talking about renting mechanisms, you know, we are talking probably going back to some kind of housing associations or, or councils or whatever. Now this all has nothing to do with Europe. There is a discussion going on now about the shortage of skills. You know, we are being told there's not enough plumbers and we need Polish plumbers and, you know, Romanian builders and whatever, whatever. And when we, join, uh, when we leave Europe, there will be a shortage even bigger. Complete nonsense. You know, when I came to this country in 81, you know, this country didn't want me. You know, I was wanted by the police, you know, I had deportation orders on my head, and I had to find a place where I could go. So I sent letters to various embassies. And the Canadians came back to me and said, OK, we'll have you. Fine. But you have to work as a lumberjack. We have shortage of lumberjacks, not of architects. So there's a very simple 
mechanism, which is administrative politi political mechanism, which would allow whoever we need to come to this country. So there will be no diminishing in terms of cultural mix, there will be no diminishing in immigration, whatever, but we control it. So, so I, think, I mean, the survey says that 53% uh, of uh, people in the construction industry feel that actually the situation would be, would be worse with the Brexit. Worse in what way? Uh, that's the question. It says, many UK construction projects are already being hampered by a skill shortage. Mm. Brexit would exasperate the shortage even more. Well, why don't we train them? I mean, there's so many unemployed people in this country. Why don't we train them? Yeah, train them. I mean, why yeah, do we have to rely on nurses from, from uh, Philippines and, you know, and plumbers from Poland, whatever? You know, I mean, it's just completely surreal. I mean, that's an important point, actually. We do need to improve vocational training in this mm. country. But I think mean, our members are reporting a, a serious skill shortage. Um, over half our members have problems finding bricklayers. There are stories of bricklayers earning 50 to 60,000 pounds a year in London. Uh, so there is a skill shortage. Um, and uh, the, the fact is that the European Union has allowed that movement of people, which has helped address that problem to a certain extent. Um, but the key, I think, is actually in terms of vocational training in this country. But if we came out of Europe, I can see that problem being exacerbated. Uh, by not having enough people coming into the country to do the work that we need. Unless, of course, economic shock, less work needed, fewer people need to do work, economy goes downhill. No, but we can allow them to come in. We can advertise you know, in every paper but you're, on the planet. We, we need plumbers. Do you want you know? to choose certain people? Absolutely. Let's, um, let's move on from skills and talk about, you know, I guess, building upon the need to be open. Uh, Mark, you talked about you know, doing business internationally. You enjoy the freedom. We've been able to get your wine cheaply. Yes. <laughs> and to move around. But also, I can imagine as, an, as a major international practice, you know, the ability to be able to attract skills and to be able to service and to be able to export uh, more freely. You talked about trade agreements. I mean, tell us a little bit more about that, that concern. I mean, is this true? Surely, you know, outside of the EU and the shackles of all that regulation, we're going to be freer to be able to negotiate better deals internationally? Um, well, in theory, I mean, I, I don't... I, I don't deny that but I think that you know you've uh, it's been well documented you know Canada's been negotiating with the EU for seven or eight years and hasn't got a deal yet we haven't got a you know I think these trade deals um, don't don't happen overnight and I think although there would there would obviously be a, a period of, of, of maybe a couple of years where in, in between we'd use existing agreements and I know I know the uh, the World Trade Organization has existing um, existing agreements and, you, and there are arguments that you would you could trade under those. I think that it's, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty. I think actually, um, you know, we, uh, we, we, we benefit from being under the EU umbrella, but also our distinct character is kind of, um, I, think, I think the British are explorers. Some might say um, invaders, but explorers anyway. I'm going to say explorers. <laughs> and I think we've got a naturally adventurous spirit. And I think certainly this practice has, has benefited from um, a certain, um, you know, a mixture of uh, swashbuckling kind of adventure and naivety to go to all these countries around the world, and we've been very successful in building, you know, taking our specialisms and our our, our uh, skills abroad. Um, what what I don't want, and, I, and the specifics, people like Paul will know better than I will. But I think the specifics of it, it, it concerns me that 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 route, uh, not only to you know exciting work that's a great advert for this country, but it's also very exciting for the architects um, in, in, in my company and for, for me personally to work on, that would be impinged in, in some way. Um, so yes, I mean, and, and, and just in terms of the skills, I know here at Grimshaw, 50% of our, 55% of our people are, are British. We've got, uh, there are 30% there are of those are from the EU and 15% of those are from uh, the rest of the world. So actually we have a lot of uh, you know, EU architects here who've moved here because there is a there is a there is a skill shortage for, for architects in, in in this country. We find it very difficult to get them, um, and also it's very difficult also to to employ say Australian and American architects because of the the the, 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 the um, restrictions in place in terms of immigration. Right. Good. I'm going to bring in Paul and then Cesari. Um, look, the last point about Americans and Australians, that's exactly the point, is to actually have a level playing field. So, um, because you can't have it both ways, you can't talk about the fact that you've got 500 million people to trade with in the EU, and then say, hold on, there's 500 million people in the EU, but we can't find enough of them to come over here and, uh, and, and skill up our construction industry. You know, there must be, uh, but if we can widen it further, that'd be fantastic. In terms of trade agreements, 95% of the companies in this country, including the one that I own, I, that I used to run before I was elected, 
does not trade outside the UK. They, they, they just trade with you know, UK businesses, but they have to comply with 100% of the regulations. In terms of trade agreements, um, we, you know, again, last year for my, for, for my business, I uh, negotiated a lease on a new office in, uh, in Croydon, where we're based. Um, it cost me a couple of grand in solicitor's fees, a few months going back and forth with a large client of ours that we were renting from. Um, then this year, I negotiated a lease on my own constituency office. It cost me exactly zero pounds with a solicitor and a day because I already had something in place. So when you're looking at trade agreements, we already have trade agreements with Europe and, and we have the basis of trade agreements that we can start. So we're not starting with a blank canvas. But when you're talking about uh, when I was talking about freely trading with other countries and the fact that we're hampered by doing that, by being within the EU, you only have to look at some of the e uh, um, trade agreements that EU are trying to negotiate. The one with Australia, for example, has taken years. Why? Because Italian tomato growers are causing a problem. We're trying to negotiate something with Canada. It's causing problems. Why? Because of an obscure uh, problem with Romanian visas. It's, you're trying to get 28 different countries, member states, to agree to... Uh, to, to what we're do, want to, wanting to do is incredibly difficult, which is why when uh, Zari says talks about elephants don't gam, um, gallop, it's absolutely right. You know, I find from having run a small business to be nimble, to be agile in this global world when you've got Google and Amazon and Starbucks running rings around uh, UK and, and EU government structures is, is really important in the 21st century. Well, who'd have thought we'd get Italian wire and Italian tomatoes into this debate? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Cesare, if you want to pick up on this point yeah, as well, then I, after Cesare, we're going to talk about major projects. I want so. to talk to you about a world which most of you are not familiar with, which is Europe divided by the Iron Curtain. Sorry, Europe divided by what, sorry? By the Iron Curtain. Okay. I'm just so, no, we yeah, are coming back to you, just uh, bowl to <laughs> Um Polish architects work in, in Poland, a country which is behind the Iron Curtain. They need visa to every country on the planet. They win competitions in Spain and Europe and whatever, they go and work. There's no problem. Because our skill is transferable. You know, we have no issues working anywhere, whether we are in Europe or out of Europe. And I think it's important to remember this, that you know, if our clients want us, and there's an interesting dichotomy between us, you know, Wimshaw's employ six, seven hundred people, I employ three. I designed three, four new cities in Angola. You know. So I'm a buccaneer as well. You know, I love I love combining my work with, with travel, with music, with food, with whatever. You know, and I'm doing it my scale, but my scale is such that Europe is an obstacle to my business. And I've got lots of quotes for you. Cedric Price, you remember this guy? Yeah? Okay. Architecture should encourage people's appetite to behave in ways which they thought impossible. Architects need to become the visionary agents for the society if they are to avoid being left to pick up shy pieces of shy decisions and choices. So architecture is not about money. Architecture is about humanity, the world, the environment, everything else. Thanks. Although, although I've got to say, you do need the trade agreements to get paid for that visionary. Um, uh, I got know. paid. I made 60% profit on my Angolan cities. And to be fair, this, we're talking about free trade agreements. We're, we're talking we about free trade like agreements because you can all, you, we can already trade with other countries. You know, we're already trading with. Uh, we're uh, one of the biggest investors in India. They're one of the biggest investors in the UK. So these trade is already happening. 24th of June, if we decided to leave, uh, you know, even Stuart Rose, the uh, former M uh, Marks and Spencer's boss who's heading up the uh, Stronger In campaign, said nothing will change. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not, we're not going to fall off a cliff on the 24th of June. But, but Paul, you say nothing's going to change, and yet, you know, the industry is actually really concerned about the effect uh, potentially on, on major projects. Yeah, but the industry so is... So the, is so, the, so the survey says that... You know, what would the effect of Brexit be on proposed major infrastructure projects like Crossrail, HS2, Heathrow? Mm. And 37% of uh, respondents, and it's 3,000 people, so it's a pretty good, pretty good survey, so well done, guys. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're very concerned about this. So, you know, ma major projects. Um, there's no, there's, I don't see any reason that, you know, you, you guys are involved more heavily in it than I am, but I, I can see no reason that the existing projects need to change. What will happen, though, we will be able to come out of the, especially when we're talking about domestic projects, we'll be able to come out of the European procurement rules, so, uh, when you, the, which will allow smaller companies, again, yeah. to have half a chance of uh, getting, getting involved in some That's more... That's true on, 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 on the procurement. It might be beneficial to small companies, such as 
mine. But I, um, we, my members don't get involved in major infrastructure projects. But as I understand it, there is considerable investment from the European Investment Bank, £7.8 billion pounds, um, loaned to the UK over a uh, 30 year period. What would be the impact of that if you came out? Well, I mean, that's a fascinating question because, the, as I said at the beginning, you know, both sides at the moment are creating foam. You know, there is no way of knowing. I mean, you know, I, there's 450,000 Poles in this country. And I have a Polish employee in my office, you know, I've got Polish builders and whatever. And you know, they're all worried what would happen. Why aren't they told that people who came here before a certain date are allowed to remain and others go? You know, EBRD is money. Money doesn't have interest in the European community. You know, the money was invested, it was invested because there's a return, and the money will stay here. That's my take on this. Well, you it, know that, though, but there's, there's that, not, because nobody, no, but well, because it's, nobody knows. It's, it's important to actually look at the bank. It's oh, why do you take it's a risk? It's, just it's important to look at the. You talk about the European bank. I mean, the Sorry. thing is, well, there's two, two things. First of all, you, if you look at how we would have to exit, not not the model that we would necessarily choose to to go to, but how we would exit. We could. There's a thing called the Article 50 of the of the, of the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, that um, allows us a two-year exit period once we've handed our notice in. We don't have to hand our notice in on June the 24th. There's no reason we can actually do some informal negotiations with the EU to start to see what sort of shape we would like to take with, with our relationship with the EU going forward and then hand our notice in and then the two-year period kicks in. But with regard to the European Bank, mm. where did the money come from? This is all part of the negotiations. You don't sit there, you know, th there wasn't just suddenly the EU came about and then suddenly there was a whole load of billions of pounds in the e in the, in the um uh, in euros, Paul, euros. Yeah, you know, this is a, 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 lot, a, lot of, yeah, a lot of this money has come from the net contributors, of which we are one. There are very few, I think it's nine countries out of the 28 that are net contributors. And but we've not fund that, that back. Because actually, well, no, that, that's, that's, that's part of the negotiation. Building a, a, you know, a safer uh, Europe. We heard earlier that actually two world wars in the first 50 years of the 20th century, we've had 70 years of peace. So if we're a net contributor and that benefits Europe, makes it a safer world, I think that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, we're going to that narrow mentality of saying we'll do what be is best for us and we don't care what's going on around us. No, the context I was saying that is that when we took terms of negotiating those, those loans from the European Bank, you know, we've helped to pay into the European Bank and so therefore that should obviously be part of the... You know, so you why, why, come why, back? Why, well, no, I'm just saying they shouldn't be defaulting on a loan the day after, just uh, out of spite, frankly. Right, let's, no, bring in, let's bring in David now. He's yeah, been waiting I mean, patiently. If, if we're talking about major infrastructure projects, it, it seems to me that... Um, it's not before time that we're, we're making this investment in this country in some of our infrastructure, because there's no question a lot of it's become pretty decrepit over the last, uh, the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And you know, the, the attitude that we've had here has been to, 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 to kind of save, uh, to, to, to get ourselves into a position where, as a country, we're able to make that investment. And I, I think it, you know, if, if you look at the predictions for the next 15 years, the UK is actually investing more in construction and in infrastructure than uh, any other of the G7 countries in terms of its, its growth. So it just seems to me that you know, to, to, to take a decision like coming out of the EU at this point in time, we really could be putting that, that pledge, that, that, that commitment that we've made at serious risk because you know, we, it will undoubtedly bring uncertainty for, 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 for the country and for, for, the ind for, for industry. And you know, that, that investment, we will not be able to continue to make the same confidence if, if the whole you know, international investment infrastructure that occurs in this country starts to, starts to fade. So, you know, for, for, for me, it, there, is a, there is a link between the two, and I, I completely understand the, you know, the survey result that's come in. All right, Mark? Yeah, I think that, that if you, we're in a, in terms of infrastructure, we're in a, you know, we're in a period that's even more important, I think, than even the Victorian era. We're, we, we're, we've, our attitude towards infrastructure has changed in the last 15 or 20 years, and we've luckily enough been at the forefront of a lot of that change. And a lot of that has been EU, EU funding, or, or it's, 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 come, it's come through the EU, and actually we, are, we don't have the, co the companies, the large um, um, construction companies to do it. So you see Spanish, you see French, companies getting involved in there. Yeah, just, just because we can't, we know the, there, isn't, there aren't the people in this country to do it. So, that's, so we, we have benefited from that. And uh, just, to, just finally to say something that, that, that about, uh, to, to respond to what Paul said about you know, getting time and all that sort of stuff. I mean, this is a breakup. We've all been through a breakup, right, between a, you know, either, either a girlfriend or a boyfriend. 
And uh, they, aren't, they aren't reasonable people. As soon as you tell them you don't love them anymore, <laughs> they aren't going to want to do, do anything with you. And it's not just them, it's the rest of their family too. I don't know many people who've stayed friends with that. So I think that in terms of reasonableness, I'm not sure how reasonable they're going to be. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to turn to your good selves to, uh, to bring you into this, into this debate. Uh, which is already getting heated up, which is great. Um, I, I want to return, um, and Paul, if I may, to ask you for your, your opinion on this. I mean, you, you stated an interesting fact there, which was that 90%, 95% of businesses in the UK do not trade outside of the UK. I think, you know, it's kind of yeah. in trade. So, uh, you know, I wonder whether you know we, we could reflect a bit further on the kind of uh, is this about big business and small business? Kind of, you know, aspect. And it, uh, there's you know, an element of that. There's an element to that. Yeah. There's so element to that. There were 30,000 lobbyists in Brussels, and they were there for a reason. Yeah. Um, the uh, an example I cited the other day. I was talking about James Dyson. So he came up with his uh, revolutionary vacuum cleaner. Uh, what did all the um, the traditional vacuum cleaner manufacturers did? They actually lobbied Brussels uh, using a few of these 30,000 to uh, change the uh, the regulations so that the vacuum cleaners had to be tested in a dust-free environment, which is pretty nonsensical when you're thinking about what you actually <laughs> tested. Um, uh, but that actually be benefited the, 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 um, the existing companies, which is why you get organizations like the CBI and these sort of uh, these coming in there, because they're best suited, they tend to represent big businesses, and they tend to therefore um, have a little bit of an advantage. I mean, if you look further into those figures, um, the 44% of our trade is within the, with the EU, with the EU member states. But it's not the EU, it's the EU member states, that's the other thing. There are 20, you know, 28 com countries, we all look on this as a block. They don't move in a block, yes they do in terms of free trade, but German, German, Germans buy some things from us, Dutch buy other things from us, Netherlands buy other things, you know, um, Greece buy other things from us, etc. But that means that 60 odd percent of our uh, trade is with other countries around the world. And that figure is getting bigger, it, by, by, uh, by in, at some uh, um, accelerating speed, we are trading around the world. So the EU is becoming less relevant as part of our economy, rather than more so. Okay. Good, thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to turn the turn the tables now. Um, now I'm going to try and attempt maybe pull out a few points from this debate so far. Um, I've got a, a lot of notes because it's uh, it's we've covered a lot of ground from tomatoes to wine. Um, but also, you know, it's, uh, psychology, Mark Twain, immigration, sovereignty, economics, uncertainty, world wars, peace, um, trade negotiations. I mean, my gosh, talk about a, a wide, diverse debate. I think what's also interesting is the kind of, um, we oscillate between the kind of personal and the professional mm. in this debate. So and it's, it's quite hard, isn't it, to kind of distinguish between the two, and perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't be concerned about that, but, you know, there is a... Uh, I mean, Brian's representing the personal views rather than the Federation's views. The Federation hasn't come out with an official view, which I thought, and it's interesting, hasn't it? There's been a lot of that, hasn't there, in the press, where some organizations say, well, you know, as the chief executive of this company, this is my view, but this is not the view of my company. Um, so, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting debate, how it's, uh, it's a very personal debate, uh, as well as being a very professional debate. Um, but um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, for three questions. Uh, so I'll do a round of getting three questions from the audience. And then uh, if you want to target your question to a particular panelist, then please do say. Otherwise, I'm going to ask the panelists to, uh, to respond to your question, whoever wants to pick it up. So do, do remember that when you're asking your question. If you could say your name and where you're from, that would be helpful. Uh, and as much as possible, please refrain from a long uh, diatribe opinion on your view on this. You know, we, want, we want kind of questions rather than opinions. Of course, you know, a very brief opinion is fine if it's in the context, but uh, we want to try and make, get in as many questions as possible. So I uh, want to try and keep a, a good, good pace going for this period. We've got until 10 o'clock, um, so my plan is to kind of do half an hour of questions and answers between us, and then we'll try and attempt at some sort of summary. Uh, and at the end, we're going to have a show of hands as to who's in and who's out. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how people feel uh, after this debate. Uh, we've got a roving microphone, so if you, uh, if you want to signal uh, then uh, that would be great, uh, and, uh, and then we'll, the, the microphone will come to you. Uh, my name is Alessia Washi, and uh, I'm Italian, I've been here for... Not another Italian! <laughs> 15 years, uh, and I have a sort of small architecture practice uh, with an English uh, business partner. 
My question uh, was directed, uh, actually I have two very brief ones. One is directed to Brian uh, from the Climate Kick. That's me. It's just about... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The two Brian's, I know. Uh, we, should have, we should have split up, shouldn't we? Maybe, yeah. Uh, this is actually to you. To, uh, it's about the, uh, what you think the EU regulation have brought to sustainability in this country over the last uh, 10 or 15 years and uh, whether that's um, what, how far back they were before, how far advanced are they now and you know, where would this country be with, without some of the EU, EU, EU regulations because I somehow have a feeling that EU have brought, actually improved regulations in this country and this is to general to everybody else and so with a positive look to that rather than just negative. And then the other one is once you, once, uh, it's more general, once the UK, if the UK came out, and there's a lot of talk of money laundering and stuff like that, wouldn't, wouldn't then the government need more sort of fucked up money in this country to support the trade that it does? So would the financial then have to sort of take on, on trade? Hmm, question for me. I didn't think I was going to have to answer any questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the uh, Climate Kick is uh, it's a, it's an EU-funded uh, organisation that, that I'm working with, uh, and it's, it's Europe's answer to uh, the problem where we have lots of great ideas in Europe, and for some reason or other, we're not very good at getting them to market as quickly as our American, our American friends, for example. So the EU, in its wisdom, decided to create these, uh, these knowledge innovation communities to speed up that process. So, uh, and the, I'm working on climate change in particular. And um, I guess from a... As an organization, we believe that by working across Europe uh, in a kind of a European consortium, uh, we can get the best ideas uh, and we can develop a scale which enables us to tackle climate change that we feel would, well, I guess the, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't a question of in or out really. It's, you know, that's one of the uh, advantages of I guess, the EU system is that it's able to um, take the funds that are gathered and invest it in something like this. Um, so from my point of view, personally, uh, you know, I, have a, I see fantastic benefit from working across Europe as a, as, a, as a sort of a coherent group trying to tackle climate change, taking the best ideas from the Nordics, from Spain, from Germany, from the UK. Um, now, you could argue, of course, whether or not, maybe you could say, well, you could do that even without the in or out the EU. But somehow or other, I think it makes it a bit, uh, it does make the process easier uh, for us by having an EU institution that we can kind of tap into. Sure, we, we do, there is a lot of wastage and bureaucracy and challenge, but you know, dealing with climate change is a massive challenge anyway. So for me, anything that helps to kind of bring people together to tackle, I would argue, the world's most serious challenge uh, is a good thing. So uh, in terms of the sustainability, basically the EU has been in the only game in town for the last uh, 10, 15 years and beyond because that's all we've been in. It's done some really good things. It's done some... Uh, so is restricted is in some ways as well. So, but on the whole, I think we've been very positive. And Brian was absolutely right that we must continue to uh, collaborate because um, pollution doesn't stop at the channel. Frankly, climate ch change doesn't stop there. I'm off to a, a Greek a refugee camp on Sunday um, to talk about the migration crisis. But that's not under the auspices of the EU. That's the Council of Europe, which is a totally separate body. So we do have other bodies um, for international collaboration. In terms of investment, we, have, uh, we already have significant investment from India, as I was talking about, uh, Batsy Power Stations, Malaysian. Uh, we've got a lot of Qatari money coming in, and Middle East money, and Israeli money. So there is already a lot of um, uh, uh, international m money coming in. And I, 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 see, I think actually we can have a, a wider focus on, um, you know, if we came out of the EU, people would want to actually continue to invest specifically in, in the UK. Your question about um, moving stuff out of uh, London, you're absolutely right. Um, the Northern Powerhouse you keep hearing about at the government. In, uh, I was in Bangladesh last uh, autumn, and Bangladesh are, are able to have um, economic zones. They're sort of effectively free, free trade areas where you can go in there, you can buy land from the government, you can set up a, a, a low tax um, trading environment to promote certain uh, things. We can't do that in this country do this in the country because of EU rules. So, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, Paul, I'm just going to stop you there. Oh, yeah, what, no, I'll what I'm going to try and do is, is kind of have maybe a kind of in-out um, response to these questions as I, as I think about it. It might be kind of the fairest way of doing. So does anybody else want to respond to Alicia's question from the, from the kind of Remain side? 
which is a question about, yeah. you know, are we going to be worse off in terms of getting funds? Can I say something? No, no, no. Well, well, we're going to we, yes. we could become a, a clearing house for dirty money, couldn't we? I guess that could be a, is it, is it, is an option for us. Oh, I'm only joking. No, I, th I think the, um, yeah, you looked at me very sternly there, Brian, sorry. <laughs> I think, um, no, I, th I, th I think we are going to have to go looking for other funds, but as you know, we're, we are a trading nation, I think that maybe, maybe that would help, but I mean, it, it has to be more difficult, it has to be more difficult outside the EU, we've got to set a whole, whole lot of things up, and I think that puts, you know, at best, that puts our economy on pause for a number of years, five or six years, um, and, at, at, and at best it, it, it kicks off again, at worst it carries on for a very long time, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think, you know, we can't blame our you know, indecision on housing and things like that with the UK government, uh, whatever the government's been in there, on EU policy. It's, you know, I think the UK's to blame for some of its problems. The EU's not to blame for all of its problems. That's all I, I think. The discussion of the banks and the city is all based on London's success is based on the failure of Europe. Now, Europe's not always going to fail, so I think that position will change. But more importantly, our industry is small businesses. And is it better that we leave for the whole country and would it spread the wealth across the whole of the country and then, then take the heat out of London? It's better for the UK as a whole rather than this focus on London. Money is a blind, senseless, mindless thingy which comes if money can be taken out. So let's not have the illusion that you know, Europe is doing us a favour. The money comes here because money can make profit and be taken out. Mm -hmm. So whether it's EBRD or the Bank of Shanghai or whichever other bank, there'll be money here. If money is to be made, money will come. There's no issue. Now, in terms of being the clearing bank for you know most of world's dirty money, we are. I mean, Britain is. You know, in terms of all the dirty money. In fact, lots of this dirty money is our own money. You know, we send the money as aid to Angola to other places. The money comes back because they buy property in Kensington. You know, so that's pretty good. Now, <clears throat> in terms of my, <clears throat> my, my, my view on the small business, I'm a small businessman. You know, I, I had a practice which was going like crazy. I sold it to my partners because I was becoming an administrator. I'm a designer. I, I like to sit with a pencil in the evening and scribble. You know? So I'm out because Europe obstructs my business, very simply. You know, it makes my, my business difficult. I can manage myself without Europe. I work in Africa, which is not Europe. I'm very well received. You know, in Europe, I have to have a certain level of professional indemnity insurance to get a project. I get projects of magnitude, which, you know, Grimshaw's normally would handle in Africa. Because these guys, like my talent, they're like me. They're not bothered by regulations, insurance, and all that other crap, you know. So, my, in my view, in terms of small businesses working out of the UK would be good, and small businesses working in the UK would be good. The um, debate in Scotland last year centred on the power of London and the damaging effect that that was perceived to have on other parts of the country. And there's, there's undoubtedly a big issue there that needs to be addressed. But uh, I, I, I don't think we should underestimate the enormous value to the UK of the, the, the strength of the city of London, not just as a, as a financial centre, and obviously it's a great financial centre, but also as a great cultural centre. I mean, London is probably one of the three greatest cities of the world at yeah. the moment. You know, if you, if you yeah, ask people in any, part, yeah. in any part of the world, you know, London would probably be in the top three. And part of that is because I think within Europe, London is perceived as being a capital of Europe in a way. You know, when, when I'm traveling around different parts of Europe, people in Sweden or, or Italy or, or Germany, and may, you know, maybe others are here today, you know, they, they have this kind of affinity towards London as as, as, as a centre for them as well. Now, you know, it's understandable. I, as I live in Manchester, and you know, there is a frustration that a lot seems to come to London. So much more investment is made in London all the time, and it's really important that we address this at the, at the, at the moment. And things like the Northern Powerhouse are, are great, you know, to, 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 to create this new, this new balancing group of cities in the north that can, that, that, that can sort of fight its way and, and be actually the equivalent of many European countries, you know, just, just as a body up there in the north. But, you know, we, we've got, we can find solutions to the kind of, the, the almost uh, arrogant uh, power that London sometimes exerts over other parts of this country. But we need to do that whilst also being mindful of the huge benefits that that brings to all of us. Cause, 
you know, I, as I say, I, I love coming to this city. I feel grateful that it's, it's, it's kind of within, within our orbit, just as others in Europe do. But if we come out of Europe, won't that change? No, it's not. I don't think, it, I don't think that. I mean, the, the, the distribution of wealth isn't an EU issue, is it? So I think it's a UK, it's a UK issue. I mean, there's, I mean... No, I, meant, I meant the power of London as, yeah. a, as, a, as a city. You know, I, I can remember 25 years ago there being a debate about was... What was Frankfurt going to become the centre? You know, how, how can the UK be a, be a powerful force right on the edge of Europe, you know, a little, little country in, in some ways? But, you know, it's not happened, has it? I mean, it's, it's to do with a number of other things. It's, it's, it, language has a big play. Education has a big play. And I think, actually, the, the British character has a big play. Sounds like you're moving to leave, actually. No, I'm not. <laughs> Sounds like you're moving there for a second. No, no. <laughs> Uh, you no, you because, swung him. Because, because actually, it, it, it's coming at... <laughs> not, not, not for a moment. I mean, if, if, if we come out, then I think a lot of that will change. Because, because you know, we, 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 we probably don't recognise the, 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 the benefits that we've had over the last... So I, w- I, wonder, I wonder if Paris is, uh, is conducting a secret campaign then to help mm. help us decide to, to leave so they can come to the new capital of Europe. I get checks from the mayor of Paris. Ah, <laughs> oh, <laughs> great, great revelations. Hi, my name is Andy. I'm actually a Canadian in the Ottawa Action out in London. Um, quick question. If the vote was to remain in, do you think this whole process has created a bit of a catalyst to maybe speed up some of those trade negotiations with other countries that have been stalled at this point? I think the European Union is perhaps you know, realizing that without Britain they become much weaker, so maybe we need to improve the way we negotiate with other countries and speed those processes up. If you remain in, if you remain in. Where I think this is going to go. Now, this is how, you know, looking at how we need to reform Europe, and it's one thing, including speeding up trade relations. David Cameron went to the uh, Council of Ministers uh, a couple of months ago because uh, the threat of a referendum when we might leave, the threat of a parliamentary rebellion, in order, and he had to beg all of the Council of Ministers, all of the Prime Ministers, in order to reduce uh, or re- remove VAT from tampons. Um, and that, we still haven't got a date when this is going on, this has been going on in Parliament for months now, We're doing something nice and simple, like just being able to control our own VAT. As I say, you, you, we, we can all talk, and, and, uh, and the Member States and the Commission can talk about, let's speed up, let's reform, but actually there's every sense that it's going the opposite direction. There's the elephant. Uh, John Claude, yes, absolutely, the elephant that can't gallop. John Claude Juncker said to a colleague of mine, when she asked him about the EU budget, well, why are you not... Uh, tightening your belt when all of the nation states uh, are do- having to do that because of the economic situation. He, he actually asked, he, he, he was furious. And he says, I don't have to answer to you. Literally, he's a, a British politician, I don't have to answer to you. Well, the fact that she's a member of the public and a, and a European. That doesn't sound like the, uh, the words of a man that wants to be able to reform towards a more open, a nimbler, uh, more transparent Europe to me. Brian, have you got a view on this in terms of, you know, are we going to be better off in or out in terms of uh, progressing things like this? Well, it's a, a, a club of 28 countries. Each country has sort of its own view and you need to discuss that. That's part of being uh, joining up in the European Union. Um, I'd like to think it does speed up. Maybe that the referendum has um, been a jolt to the EU. The threat of the uh, UK coming out uh, will maybe have them rethink but I suspect actually it will still take time to, to negotiate because you are dealing with 28 countries so uh, that is the nature of the beast and the problem is actually because it's designed to be ever closer political union it is a, a bit of a hybrid at the moment so for it to work Europe has to be more integrated if it's going to be successful yes, and speed up its process you right. um, and so that's the direction of travel that the the project, the European project, needs to uh, accelerate towards if it's actually going to be more streamlined and faster in the global market. Now that presents problems, of course, with the view of the, that we had earlier about sovereignty. But actually, in the global economy, our Britain is you, uh, controlled in many ways by global forces and institutions beyond our remit already. So there's an argument actually by working more closely together we're a stronger voice in the global economy. It's a complex question, really, when you start to unravel it, uh, because I do feel uh, that for the European project to work, it will mean closer integration. It has to. Otherwise, it falls apart. And where we are at the moment is that we're halfway there and halfway not. 
Hello, Robert Lake, Sutton Construction. We are a general joint contractor and a member of the FNB. Oh, great. Also a uh, member of the NSB because we do commercial and... Uh, You're not based in Sutton, are you? You're not based in, do you say Sutton? Sutton, Sutton. Are you based in Sutton? Oh, no. oh there's <laughs> different Sutton. To confuse the enemy. <laughs> not very Sutton. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, I, I believe, and I'm just asking the question, surely the EU is running out of control. Once upon a time we were a free trading nation. But why would anybody that wants to trade with us stop trading? And why should we become a free trading nation again? I think actually, um, you know, there is there is a risk to the what happens to the EU in the future. But I think um, it raises another question. Your question raises another question. A vote to stay in is not the same as a vote to stay put. The EU will be changing, as Brian has articulated, over the next few years. There are a number of different things, not only just from an economic point of view, because the Eurozone, if the Euro is going to work, it does actually have to come closer together. We've always said we're not going to vote, um, uh, we're not going to join the Euro. We've said we don't want ever closer union, which is one of the reasons I want to say, actually, let's back out, let you get on with it, because to bring Germany and Greece closer together, let them crack on. Hi, my name is Natalia, um, I live in Greece, London. CGA main contractor. Um, my question is, if we don't have um, the opportunity to vote out now, or if we, if we remain, do you think we'll have the opportunity again? Nope. Some of the stuff that we've had uh, uh, from David talking about, this isn't the right time to, to leave. If you take that view, there is never a right time to make another decision. But this decision that you'll be taking on June the 23rd, will be with us for 40, 50 years. So it's a, and which is why it's so different from a general election. So I was talking about the, the beginning about being able to kick me out in, in four years time. You won't be able to take that decision. They, they have this, they the talk about the Scottish referendum was having a, what they call a never-endum. But let's come back <laughs> and you know, keep asking the question until we they get the right answer, which funnily enough happened in the EU. One of the, uh, I think it was the Maastricht Treaty or the Lisbon Treaty, when they, um, it was Denmark voted um, against and then they just asked the same question again until they said no, <laughs> that won't be happening here. So you know, if, if we're in, we're in. With all of the, uh, the, the risks that involve that, we don't know what's gonna happen to in, with the EU further on down the line. If we're out, we're out. And then we can at least chart our own way. And for me, as I say, from having come from a small business background, I like to be able to risk, manage my own risk. And I think rather than letting other people in other countries manage my risk. Are, are, you, are you actually convinced, actually, if it's a small margin to stay in, that the Conservative Party won't be calling, or elements of the Conservative Party won't oh, they be will calling be. for... No, they absolutely will be calling. Because oh, that's yeah. the danger, and I think that's the worst result we could ever have. Oh, no, well, I'd be, uh, no, I totally agree. A bit like the Scottish referendum, really. I, if we're having a vote, then we have a vote and we decide. Um, without people saying, well, we need another vote, because... It's not that will create more uncertainty, and not good for your party. I no, probably, well, well, no, exactly. I'll tell you on the chin. I mean, yeah. you, you're absolutely right. I'm uh, a fervent uh, person that wants to leave, but 24th of June, yeah. I'll abide by the result. Okay. okay. Mark, good. I want to bring in Mark on this one. Yeah, I think actually, I think I think the two questions are actually linked in somewhere. I, I I agree. I don't think the EU is working properly because it hasn't reached its the final version, which is a completely connected. Uh, Europe and I think that actually this this isn't the last time we'll get a chance because what 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 I think is for it to work properly or, or how people imagine it to be it has to be a very very close union and I think to do that it would have to change the treaties would have to change again within 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 a period if the treaties change again there's another there's another opportunity for us on, all on to the, on the treaty yes the on the treaty, yeah on, in yeah but, but but the two one might one might morph into another because, uh, and I think that that's, so in terms of, the, is this a, a one-time deal for 40, 50 years? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think that actually, um, it's, you know, the EU has to, has to get closer for it to work yeah. properly. And, and actually, the, uh, I think half the problem in this country is that we were misled 40 years ago. It was always the case that the European project was about ever closer political union. It was in the treaty. But politicians at that time missold it to the British public and said it was just an economic arrangement uh, for trade. It never was. It was always going to be a bigger project. And that's caused all this misunderstanding and tension between the UK and the European Union. Uh, and now, of course, we're struggling uh, for, in terms of politicians having credibility with the public because can you believe what they're saying? 
Um, but the project is always moving towards a more integrated uh, European Union. And if we had that honesty in, 19, in 1973 and all the way through, uh, that would have been very helpful. I mean, it was the Conservative government and market factory signed up to the single market, knowing full well what the implications were. So I find it extraordinary. Politicians have a lot to answer for, sorry, uh, in terms of actually really misrepresenting what the European Union is all about. And then, uh, of course, the public are confused we don't understand what it's all about. Honesty would have really helped, and then we could have made a more informed decision. But it was Maastricht later on that actually became, no, sorry, that, no. that, that sped the process up. I, I, yeah, I, see, I absolutely see what you're saying, and take that on. But it's, it's Maastricht that, that sped that up with the... Um, Speed it up, so, yeah. uh, Because we now have a president, we've got a foreign, office, uh, foreign policy, um, we've, we've changed our legal structures. Um, and these sort of things. And actually, the, the Germans are going to publish a white paper in July talking about uh, further progression towards the European army. Uh, so these sort of things, we are, actually, we are absolutely pushing forward, which, while well, I come back to the point, a vote to stay is not the same as a vote to stay forward. Yes, uh, Anna Mullane uh, from Stuart uh, Lennigan. Um, it was coming back on the trade side of things in terms of the, we heard earlier on about the 30,000 sort of lobbyists that Paul mentioned. Um, now, I guess one of those are representing big firms in uh, Europe, but I guess one also representing smaller firms collectively through, through their trade associations, such as, such as Brian's. So there's a lot of lobbying that goes on there, and certainly um, sort of the experience I've had in the past is actually the UK has been very successful there when it came to negotiating things like the, uh, the construction products directive. Um, and actually there's a lot of benefit from us being inside the camp there to negotiate it, so we make sure that the standards are being adopted the testing that we have heard about, like the vacuum cleaning side, the testing rules, are ones that suit the UK rather than are detrimental to it. Because I think otherwise we can find that okay, not all product companies trade directly with Europe, but we buy our products from Europe, um, and we sell to other firms that will then sell into Europe. Great. Thanks, Alan. So there's a value there otherwise. Um, well, I was based in Brussels for a number of years, about 20 years ago, and I think the lobbying there is in some ways much easier uh, because you can just ring up the Commission, talk to officials, you can speak to UCREP, uh, the UK's uh, civil service base there. Uh, it's easier to engage. So, uh, it's, of course, it's far better to be on the inside influencing the change. My experience is that uh, British lobbyists are very good, as are the Irish, they're very good networkers. Um, in terms of talking and, uh, and influencing the, the finer detail. Um, so, yeah, of course, better to be on the inside, helping to formulate it. You might not always get the results you want, but if we're, if we're on the outside, we have no chance of influencing the outcome of what comes out of Europe. So, of course, better Sorry? to be at the table than away from it. So, what well, do you think of that view? Yeah, I mean, you know, thinking about Norway, Norway never joined, we are leaving. And I think leaving is a deal. We have to talk to who are leaving, we have to agree some terms, we have to agree the situation and so on. You know, I, I, you know this is all talking about crystal balls, which is of no interest to me. I want to talk philosophical, you know. But... Is there a difference, crystal balls and philosoph yeah, philosophy? Yeah. Quite, quite substantial, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know, I'm not aware of any PhD written on crystal balls. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the point is such that, you know, we, we, there's a new situation for Europe and for us if we leave. As a result, there must be a dialogue how we leave. And it is absolutely agreed that there are good things about Europe. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, students have the uh, Erasmus and this and that, whatever. We are lobbying, we are dealing with stuff. But, you know, it's a matter of agreeing how we leave. And I think this is open for discussion. Cool. There's, a, there's a, um, a, a discussion to be had was whether we remain in the single market at all. I mean, Michael Gove said that, uh, suggested that we shouldn't, but that's a debate after we've decided, because it, we need to then come together, should we vote to leave, the Remain side need to come in and be part of that discussion to see what the model is. Um, because if you speak to the boss of uh, JCB, uh, he will actually say it's, it's actually cheaper to, for him to trade with America than it is with the EU, because you, you're balancing tariffs with um, cost of regulation and these sort of things. But a wider view about the decision making in the EU, the UK, we have an inbuilt majority against us uh, from the Eurozone countries, which, as we've been discussing, really have a different agenda to the UK. And the 72 times that the UK have gone against the uh, proposed legislation uh, from the EU Commission, we've lost the vote every single time. So 
you know, yes, we, you know, we have a degree of influence. You know, we are the fifth biggest uh, uh, economy in the world. We're still in the top ten manufacturing uh, in the world. We've got the fourth biggest army. We've, we're in the right. Um, we, we speak the language of business. We're in the right time zone. We've got all of these things going for us, which is why we should also be confident to leave. But it also gives us an influence. But on the other hand, there is that uh, inbuilt majority against us for that different agenda. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Alan Sharp. But I mean, like, uh, so you know, they uh, people from the Republic come over here and vote. Uh, I see no reason that we can't quickly come up with a sensible uh, uh, relationship between. In, in, you know, we're not going to be constructing big border control walls or anything like that between the uh, the north and the south. Um, so I, I would really doubt that would be that would be an issue. The the border that we would need to control would. Um, well, I mean, obviously, we need to make sure that if. We need to control the border coming in from the in the, into the airports and the ports from the from from the continent. Um, but we would already already need to tighten up procedures with the, with the south to make sure that people wouldn't then come through the south into into the north from outside from other countries. But in terms of just the movement of people between north and south, uh, the indigenous po the indigenous population, I don't think it's going to be a particular issue. I'm mean, reasonably relaxed about that. My name is Jonathan from uh, the Leave campaign has rubbished the information that's come through from the Treasury and the IMF and other sources. So where are the trustworthy sources for information about what you know, is genuinely true and right? It's really difficult because there are very, very few facts. It's all assumptions. You, I hate to talk about Cesare's balls, but um, it's all about. <laughs> it, it is all about the crystal, crystal. ball. It is all about looking forward. You know, I, I read something um, in the Evening Standard. The headline was looking about how we'd be worse off by X amount in 2065. I mean, it, who knows what they're you know having for for dinner tonight? Never mind looking at 2065. That's it. It just gets to a, a ridiculous level when you're effectively being told you can have war and a recession on one side and cheaper holidays on the other, and then this is going to be how, how better off or worse off your grandchildren are going to be. It's, it gets to a, a ridiculous point in that. So there is a, an, a, a big element of heart. It is a bigger element of uh, nationhood when you're talking about sovereignty and decision making and those kind of things. You know, what do you want to give up to, to, to return? You know, what price freedom, I suppose, in that, you know, in that slightly William Wallace way. Um, but then you do have to look at the short-term and long-term economics, but there's, they're projections, and you get a load of economists together, they'll tell you different answers, frankly. The problem we have with this whole discussion here is entirely polar, polarised at pretty high social level. You know, we live in a society which is class divided in a big way, and the perception in the general level of the society is that all the discussion pro-against is, you know, toffs at high level, eaten, educated, you know, guys, whatever, and the average person in this country thinks, well, this has nothing to do with me. You know, these guys are not me. You know, I, I don't understand what they're talking about. As a result, the bullshit spills. I mean, you know, what we are hearing is absolutely idiotic. I even don't buy any ideas which would suggest that, you know, we had no World War III because of the European community. I mean, you know, this, this is an insult to human intelligence. You know, we do learn from past experiences. We have NATO and a few other things. You know, we still have Russians who are quite difficult. But, you know, the problem, the problem we have is that, you know, there is the, the level of discussion has been removed from the level of perception of an average English person. How much of this is an emotional opinion as opposed to an objective opinion? Uh, 
uh, just out of interest for the panel, how many of you wanted uh, Scotland to stay? Oh, uh, <laughs> just I love it. What's happening now with you? Yeah. Right? Emotionally, actually, I'm, I'm very proud of our country. I'm proud of its history. I'm proud of the things that you do and, and our kind of national character. Um, so emotionally, um, there is a little uh, devil on my shoulder that's telling me to leave and we should be proud of what we do. But my head uh, is, and the, and the businessman uh, um, is saying that we should stay just because of the uncertainty, I think. Um, and I also think having studied in Scotland for five years, I think that the Scottish people should have, uh, should have voted to, uh, for independence personally. Do you really? I do. That's yeah, they because they've got, here, a, they've got a yeah. very strong national character and they should have um, stood up to their, uh, their, you know, their, their feelings on it. And it would have just put an end to the debate once and for all because we're just going to hear on it forever until we get the, until we get the, the yes vote. Uh, Scotland, I would have voted, uh, well, I, I supported to stay together, but, uh, but, but I was basically, um, you know, happy for the Scots to make their own decision. If they felt um, strongly enough about it, then that's that's up to them. They're, they've got to live their life in the, you know, there. They've got to uh, come up with the um, the consequences and the bonuses. Um, I mean, it was interesting, like you were saying about that, because I mean, the the economic argument to me didn't stack up for them to go in independent. So in terms of head and heart, it seems to be reverse. Uh, you know what you were saying in terms of the fact that uh, they have got that strong in, um, independent nation uh, viewpoint, but the. And as I say, you know, if you look at the oil prices, I think that was the economic argument to stay together was vindicated. I love the Scots. You know, you eat potatoes, we eat potatoes. You drink, we drink, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But on the other hand, you know, there is a massive difference between Scotland going independent and Britain going independent in Europe. I mean, Scotland and Britain, you know, were one this way, that way, whichever way, you know. You're sharing the land, first of all. But you know, if, if Scotland was to go free, you know, what about Italy? I mean, Italy is not a real country. You know, it's made of little five tons, you know, which were put together in an artificial way. You know, why don't you split? Why did Napoli become a separate republic and you know, Sicily, Sicily would become something else? You know, there has to be some kind of limit, because this way we get back to wars again. You know, if the individual interests of small groups of, of, you know, of identity, you know, Catalonia, you know, north of Spain and so on, you know, this, this would go complete bonkers. Isn't that reason, though, to, to stay in Europe? Though? No, it's not, because you know, what, what I'm saying is you know, splitting, splitting countries, which are organisms, into small sub-organisms is completely different from you know, the European project, which is a completely different concept. Okay. And, you know, and in fact, this, sorry, the, concept, the concept cannot work. I mean, look what's happening in Greece, what's happening in Spain. We've got total disparity of income, total disparity of culture, this total disparity of ideals, you know, it just cannot work. I mean, Europe will collapse. I mean, I probably long, not live long enough to see it, but you know, Europe will disintegrate. I think it depends on how many potatoes and tomatoes you keep on eating, sorry. <laughs> hey, um, so guys, we've, we're coming to the end now, so I've got no more time for questions, I'm sorry. What I'm gonna ask our panelists to do is in 30 seconds, give a final sort of just parting remark uh, as a kind of a, a summing up, if you like, and um, uh, Brian, is it all right if we could start with you? Just a quick, a quick kind of commenting. There, what, and maybe reflect on what you've heard in the last. You know, we've been debating the last hour. Is there something that's kind of come out as a strong point for or against? And be free to to swing in or out, of course, gentlemen, if you yeah. choose. Well, and it, uh, for me, uh, emotionally, it's nice to be in control of what you do. Uh, so the uh, the leave is uh, an interesting idea, but. Actually, in terms of Britain's best interest going forward, I still remain convinced that we're better within the European Union because of the stability it gives us, the single market, the fact we can move and travel and work all across Europe. Working together surely is the best way to go. I would be fearful if we came out uh, in terms of the economic instability. I wonder what would happen to the European project because we had the, sort of the doom scenario presented there. And Actually, for all of us in this country whose grandparents, great-grandparents were in two world wars, that is a shadow, I think, <coughs> of my generation, that I wouldn't want that repeated again. I think we are better talking, working, sharing ideas. And of course, there are differences in Europe. That's great. That makes Europe a very culturally rich, in the same way London's very different and it's changing its character. It's very international. That is to be celebrated. And I think the European Union offers us the best opportunity to do that. Thanks, Brian. Cesare. More quotes. 
No, please don't. My, 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 you know, I'm a small little individual, you know. Okay, John Cage, remember? The composer who changed the world. I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I'm frightened of the old ones. Abraham Lincoln. Always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other. And finally, I work in Africa, a little African proverb. If you think you are too small to make a difference, lock yourself up with a mosquito in a room. You know, we can all make a difference. And for me, the ones who want to stay are chickens, the ones who are courageous, who want to change the world, who want to conquer the world. Get out. You know Krishnamurti? Read the book called Freedom from the Known. It changes your life. Thank you. I'm going to go to David next and then come back to you, Paul, just to kind of get a balance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we've got to, I think we need to be in there and we need to be fighting our corner and not, not being separatist and being outside. But I think that the point that Natalia made just now is important, actually, because I think, I think when we make this decision, then it will be a decision that lasts a long period of time. And if it's a decision to come out, it's, it's not as if we can go back in again. You know, I mean, it's a very big step to move out of this, this, this system that actually, it's got its warts, it's got its problems, but it's served us very well over the last 40 years. And I think that we've got to be there fighting that corner going forward. And incidentally, I think that uh, if we do come out, it could mean the end of the, the European uh, of the, the, the British Union because uh, it's very possible that Scotland will then vote to go independent and to go, go in itself if it can. And you, know, you don't need to be that clever to work out which, which route that takes us down, which quite honestly, from both a business and a, you know, both a head and a heart point of view, I would have to say I think would be a great shame. Okay, thank you. Paul. I should say, on the negative side, don't buy the government's scary scenario or super scary scenario. If there was any prospect, a realistic prospect of a war, a, recession, a deep recession, all these sort of things, what kind of prime minister will actually hold a, a referendum when 50, you've got a 50% chance of those things actually happening? So I really don't buy the government line that's been pumped at the moment, which will stop on Friday when a, a thing called Perda period kicks in. And so it would just be a debate between the two groups rather than the government throwing everything at it that they've done. But I ask you to be optimistic, to look outside, have the confidence in your country. I repeat the fact that we are the fifth biggest economy, we've got the fourth biggest army, we speak the language of business, we're in the right time zone. How much bigger, how much more influential do you need to be to be able to uh, carve our own way, manage our own risks, still collaborate with Europe in terms of trade, in terms of environment, in terms of security? but we can also collaborate in the new global world with other economies, booming economies that are going to do dominate the world for the next 50 years. Thanks, Paul. And may I also just take the point to say, as a politician, thank you very much for being so brief. Think of <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It's a real, a real joy. Um, Mark, um, you've got the last word, which is how appropriate is that as the host? Oh, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Um, yeah, people here will be, will be familiar with that, of course. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> I think that uh, what, what I would want to say is that the, the, the debate is really interesting and today's been really interesting and, and you know, there's very, very intelligent reasons to leave and there's very, very intelligent reasons to remain. As, as a person who's, um, who loves risk, who, 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 who I like to think I am, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm very beguiled by, by the league just because it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a crazy, new, interesting kind of scenario, but actually the, the, the nagging thought at the back of my head is that actually, you know, Really, there's there's too much risk there. Too much can go wrong. There's too many people against us to to succeed, and that's the thing that kind of holds me back. But I, I will admit that my uh, my my personal barometer has been shifted uh, toward towards leave, but not enough for me to vote to leave. Can I help? <laughs> I'll speak to you. I'll speak to you about after. Yeah, it was All the right. quotes. It was the quotes. <laughs> That's really, they're brilliant. Right. Give us another one. There's got to be one more before we go. Okay. Well. Hey, no, I I think Why not? He, he, he had a really good one from Albert Einstein, he told me earlier. You haven't used that one yet. Yeah, Einstein, Einstein. Right. Go on. Go on, then. Go on. Let's finish. <laughs> you all know this quote, you know. What he said is that if you repeat an action expecting different results, you're an idiot. Now, Britain has been pushing its agenda in Europe for years and years and years, getting nowhere. <laughs> okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I thought it would be really interesting now, uh, before we close, is to have a sort of a 
a show of hands as to which way you as an audience, so actually you do get the last word, um, uh, which way you're thinking of voting. So uh, for those who would like to remain in uh, Europe, if you could raise your hands, please. You're all misguided, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who would like to uh, take a quick exit and, uh, and go out. Okay, pretty interesting. Wow, this is quite different to the, to the survey results. Uh, Great. Can they ask if anyone, uh, uh, has anyone changed their mind? That's the question. Oh. I was Right. Are you still undecided? Oh, okay, right, great, okay. So we've had well, hand if, influence. If anybody good. needs help with, you know, <laughs> the right decision, I'm happy to, to oblige. All right, so um, what I'd like to do is just, uh, if we could thank our panellists, because it's been a fantastic debate. Okay. Round of applause, thank you very much. And uh, I had this kind of picture in my mind, uh, and it's of the elephant. And uh, I think it's a great kind of symbol, so Cesare, thank you for that. And I guess, you know, in a way I can think of it in I've two... Got, I've got six more. You've got six more. <laughs> so, you know, it, if I was to summarise the debate, I'd say, you know, there's this kind of picture of the elephant being this kind of lumbering beast that isn't able to move quickly enough, which is one view. But I was also viewed the elephant as this very strong, large animal that, you know, has the ability to kind of push through uh, big issues because of its weight and its muscle. So, you know, maybe something in there in terms of, you know... We, it, can, it, we can run the circles around the elephant. We can. We can run that. So, um, you know, fantastic debate. Thank you all very much for being a great audience and for your questions. Um, thank you to our host, Grimshaws. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you to UK Construction Week. <laughs> and thank you to World Architecture News. Very good for them. And I feel like I'm in question time now, and I'll say next, next week's issue will be... <laughs> you know, thanks, everybody.